Hey, to the people joining the live stream, we'll start in like two minutes, so just hang tight. And wow, so exciting. Okay, let's just test the mic quickly. Can everybody hear me? Okay, great. So welcome everyone to our first Astro Night of the 2022-2023 academic year. It is so nice to see all of you here in person again. Um, my name is Hannah Fronenberg. I am a PhD student here at the Miguel Space Institute. I'm the Astro Miguel coordinator, and I'm also your moderator tonight. So a few reminders before we start. Uh, the MSI and Astro Miguel are committed to EDI, and we only share Astro awesome things if everyone feels safe and welcome and comfortable tonight. So if you have any concerns or anything throughout the night, uh, you can find any of us with a pin. I don't know, people raise it, pin people. Can you raise your hands or they're scattered throughout the room so if anything if you need any help tonight you can ask one of them i would also just like to um draw your attention to our um code of conduct this is the set of rules by which we try to conduct ourselves so please keep this in mind throughout the evening um this is an interactive panel, so we'll be taking questions from the audience. There will be people throughout the lecture hall handing out pieces of paper and pens if you would prefer to ask your question anonymously. Um, we are also live streaming to YouTube, so people on YouTube, feel free to type your questions in the chat, and we will be asking them at the end. So hi, everyone on YouTube. So tonight, we'll be tackling topics in planetary science. And you'll also have the chance to ask uh, three amazing planetary scientists your questions. So first we'll hear from MSI professor Eve Lee. Uh, we'll learn about exotic exoplanets and why they are so hard to find. Next we'll hear from MSI postdoc Thomas Navarro, who will be telling us why our solar system is so unique and where we might find life uh, here in our own solar system. And finally, We'll have MSI grad student Jared Splinter, who will be telling us about the most pressing observations to be made in planetary science and some exciting new observational techniques that will make that all possible. So without further delay, let's welcome Professor Eve Lee.
Okay. All right. Um, good, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Hannah, for uh, opening up this uh, this event and also for the kind introduction. So, um, only just about a little less than forty years ago, the only known planetary system in our galaxy was our own, the solar system. And it wasn't until 1988 that we had the very first detection of an exoplanet. And as Canadians, we should be really proud of this because it was made by Canadian astronomers at UBC, University of British Columbia. If you haven't heard about it, it's probably because it was a very controversial detection at the time. Even now, finding a planet is a really tremendously difficult endeavor. We are trying to find the signal of something that's about 100 times smaller than the star that it orbits around, and also about a million times lighter than the star that it orbits around. So imagine how difficult it must have been back in the 80s. And what won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2019 was the first detection of an exoplanet around a sun-like star. And that is an important qualifier around a sun-like star because it drives right at the question of, are we living in a system that is weird? Are we living on a planet that is a special place in our galaxy and in this universe? But just having that one planet out there doesn't really help us answer that question. And by the way, that planet was a really weird one. It was a hot Jupiter. Um, in order to answer this question, we need to have a better picture of the overall census of planetary population in our galaxy. So that is why we had the launch of the Kepler Space Telescope by NASA in 2009. And it is this mission that completely revolutionized our field, finding thousands and thousands and thousands of exoplanets. And now we have more than 5,000 detected and confirmed other worlds out there. By the way, it's not just the fact that this mission found this like humongous um, data set of all this uh, different planets out there. It's the fact that these were planets that just looked so weird by solar system standards. Most of the planets out there look nothing like what we see in our own. Here's the solar system. It's a very ordered system. On the inside, on the inside, we have this terrestrial rocky planet going from Mercury to Mars. On the outside, we have this large gas giant. Why do we call them gas giants? Because uh, they are mostly made out of gas rather than rocks. So from Jupiter to Neptune, these have very thick gaseous envelope on top. So small planets on the inside, large planets on the outside. And then you take a look at there's other worlds out there that Kepler found, and turns out most of those planets fall right in between this boundary between rocky and the gassy planets. And we call them the super Earths and mini Neptunes. Super Earths because these are scaled up version of a rocky planet like the earth. They're about one, uh, one to twice the size of the earth. And then mini Neptunes because they're scaled down version of the Neptunes. So these are two twice to four times the size of the Earth. And these planets do not exist. The size scale just do not exist in our solar system. There's a gap that turns out most of the other stars out there have so about 30 to 50% of all sunlight stars have exactly these types of planets. So in that sense, our solar system is weird. There's another ways in which our solar system is weird in that we have nothing inside the orbit of Mercury. But if you look at this other stars out there, most of them have up to about five planets that fit right within the orbit of Mercury. So all these planets out there are tightly packed in very close to the central star. And by the way, that the Nobel Prize discovery, the hot Jupiter, 
that was a Jupiter-sized planet that are really, really, really close into the central star, about 10 times closer to its own star than the Mercury sun distance. So again, we have this huge diversity in terms of what kind of planets that we see out there. And also this preferred kind of planets that our galaxy like to produce. So before we answer the question of why is our solar system so weird, we should first try to answer the question of why is it that our galaxy prefers to create these kind of intermediate sized objects? So in this short 15 minute discussion, I will talk about some of the underlying physics that can explain this diversity that we see in our planetary population and also why is it that our galaxy like to produce these specific types of planets. So the story of planet formation begins from the formation of stars. Until very recently, I used to show scientific images from Hubble Space Telescope, but we have the James Webb Space Telescope up there right now, the JWST, that, and we're starting to get some first images. So here is a detailed view of a nearby star forming region, Orion Nebula, coming from the Webb Space Telescope. It looks like a nice painting, it's not a painting, this is an actual scientific image. You will see this bar like feature over here. That is a dense region of gas and dust. And if you can zoom in, you will see all the filaments. And if you zoom into those filaments, you'll see all these clumps, these dense clumps of gas and dust that will collapse under its own self gravity. But as this clump is collapsing, it's also spinning. And if you've ever tried to squish something that's spinning, maybe you've just done some clay work, maybe you might remember that it's really hard to squish it in a certain direction and you end up with a pancake. So around these stars, we have a spinning disk of gas and dust. And because Webb Space Telescope is so amazing, you can actually see directly a young star with the disk around that is still forming enveloped by a cocoon of gas and dust. And it's this blob right over here. So we're gonna zoom in, that's the blob, that's the disc, and it's still surrounded by a cocoon. And just to impress upon you, this a uh, huge length scales we're talking about, the orbit of Neptune fit right within this disc. And we have zoomed in quite a bit to resolve something of order the size of the orbit of the Neptune. So zooming to this disk, it is inside this disk that we have the formation of planets. And that's why we call this disk as protoplanetary disks. So let's zoom in to this disk and talk about how exactly the planets form. If I were to describe to you a planet in its simplest term, I would say it's a rock with some gas on top. That's what Earth is. That's what most of the planets are. So where does that rock come from? It's a solid rock. So it has to come from the solids within these disks. And I said that this is a disk of gas and dust. That's a solid dust. But when I say dust, I'm talking about something that's about a micron sized grain. And what is a micron? You get a micron when you take a strand, a single strand of your hair and cut it along the length of that hair by about 50 to 100 times, then you get a micron. So somehow you go from this tiny, tiny micron sized dust grain all the way into a few thousand kilometer sized rock that we are sitting on or standing on right now. How exactly do we do that? Um, that entire journey has not completely yet been mapped out. There are still some missing puzzles. That, that we're still trying to figure out. But for this discussion, let's just assume that we have this rock because we see them. And this rock is massive enough to gravitationally attract and hold on to that gaseous atmosphere where that gas comes from this disk. But in this birth environment of the planet, this birth environment itself is also evolving where most of the gas is being lost by the winds 
and also being drained onto the central star. We know this because we can directly observe it. Let's zoom into this planet and talk about why is it that some planets just remain as more of a rocky planet, whereas others have this intermediate sized gaseous envelope, while others just become this large gas giant? So, again, we have this rock, it is massive enough to attract and hold on to some gaseous atmosphere out to its gravitational sphere of influence. Now, this bound gaseous atmosphere, it gets really hot as it falls onto this rock. And when you have this hot material surrounded by colder material, that hot gas would like to cool off. It's just like when you have a mug of a hot coffee or tea, it'll cool off over time. It's the exact same thing here, except we're dealing with a gas and not a liquid. And when you have a hot ball of gas that is, that is cooling off, that ball of gas tends to shrink. And that might be hard to picture, but you can actually directly see this in real life if you have easy access to liquid nitrogen. So I did not have easy access to liquid nitrogen. Um, my experimentalist colleagues do, but I'm a theorist. So um, here is just a demo that uh, I found on YouTube. It's public. Um, so let's see if it plays. Uh, it plays. Um, not the sound though, that's okay. All right, we'll just we'll just keep going. Um, so what the uh, what this uh, demo presenter is going to do is uh, he's going to make a balloon filled with his own breath. So that's air. And he's going to put this balloon inside uh, liquid nitrogen. And of course, liquid nitrogen will pull off this balloon and watch what happens to this balloon. It shrinks, right? It shrinks. Just because it's cooling off. All right, so if you have easy access to liquid nitrogen, you can try this at home. Um, so based on that very simple um, thermal physics, what theorists like me do is use that fundamental physics to come up with some sort of a tool, like an expression, like equations to understand what we see in the nature, like in the universe, like what this planet does. So here is the expression that we derived using just pen and paper calculations. And this is not to scare you off. This is just to show you what theorists do and also to emphasize what is the key ingredient that controls whether something just remains a rock or whether something builds a very thick gaseous atmosphere. And that has everything to do with how massive this rocky core was at the beginning. So here in this scientific plot, going from bottom to the top, we're seeing thicker and thicker atmosphere. Going from left to right, we have heavier and heavier rocky core. So the heaviest kind of rocky core is able to accrete so much gas that this planet will become the gas giants like our own Jupiter. But if you're sort of like intermediate size, and if you also happen to form really late so that you, you didn't have as much time until the disk just completely lost all its gas, then you end up with this uh, mini Neptunes, this intermediate size object. And if this cores for some reason assembled so late that there was no gas left whatsoever in the birth environment, then of course you just end up with a rock like the super earth. And again, our galaxy prefers the formation of this intermediate size and small planets. So it must be that most of these planetary cores tend to assemble really late, just as this disk gas, this birth environment is about to shut off almost all of its gas. And you, you sit on that and you start thinking, well, that seems very fortuitous. 
that it seems like almost like a coincidence that this would happen. But let me tell you that this is expected, again, from some fundamental physics. So at the very beginning, this birth environment is full of dense gas. And inside this dense gas, you only have small, tiny little rocks. And what we currently see in planetary systems, they are a bit larger than the size of the Earth. So you have to somehow go from these tiny little rocks to more massive objects. And that can only happen when these rocks will come together, collide, and smush and merge into something bigger. And that's really difficult when there's so much gas around. Now, I can tell you why, why that is the case uh, from more, uh, or more technical terms, but if I were to give you some simpler analogy, imagine racing with your friend in a swimming pool. You're not allowed to swim, you're only allowed to run inside that swimming pool. You're also allowed to go off the course and tackle your friend. That's If you ever, ever tried it, you might remember that it's really difficult to go off the course inside a swimming pool when you're not allowed to swim as compared to doing the exact same thing in an open air at some park. And why is that? That's because it's really hard to wade through this dense fluid, this dense material. Same thing over here. You need to wait until those gas is just about to disappear so that all these rocks can go off their course and come together, collide, merge to form the bigger course. Now, for the physics students in the audience, um, to give you the actual um, the actual term, what's going on is that the gas tends to damp away all the eccentricities, and and uh, you need to wait until the gas goes away for the rocks to perturb each other and excite its eccentricity, elongate its orbit, and that allows the orbits to cross each other, and that allows these rocks to come together and create even bigger rocks. And because this, light, this is most likely to happen when there's not a lot of gas around, this creates an ideal environment for the formation of those mini Neptunes and super Earths that is the most common in our galaxy. So that's it for me. And I will now hand off to Thomas, uh, who's gonna tell us uh, some of the more interesting puzzles from the perspective of the solar system. Thank you. What does your um, projecting oh. slides oh, stop okay. projecting then? I don't know how. Um, oh, cool. I so I need to close it up. Yeah. Does yeah. that work? Ah, there we go. Yeah. Well, where's the pointer? Pointer? I'm not sure. Okay. Oh, oh, that was for PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah. But uh, your cursor shows up. Okay. So, on tonight's topics is uh, planets near and far. And now is the time to talk about planets near us. Um, that is to say, planets in the solar system. And I'm going to show you uh, some examples of how planets in the solar system are very diverse. There is a lot of diversity. Uh, I'm going to give a brief overview of terrestrial planets and all the differences you can find on those planets and why it matters for exoplanets. Uh, but first of all, this is a diagram uh, from National Geographic from uh, 2012 showing all the space missions in the solar system. And each line represents one space mission. So you can see that there are a lot of space missions that have been sent to many planetary bodies, many planets since the 1960s. So we really live in an era with a very interesting time, very interesting era with a lot of data that is coming back to us. So the moon is taking the lion's share, but as you can see, there are uh, many missions sent to Venus 
uh, and Mars. So this is how we learn about planets and planetary bodies in our solar system. And so it's been 10 years. And since, since then, the trend is increasing. Uh, there are many, there are more and more actors in the field, many national space agencies. Uh, just last month, Korea sent a, a mission to the moon. So we learn more and more about planets. So I'm going to give you a few examples. So our first stop is Venus. So this is Venus uh, as captured by uh, the European Space Agency spacecraft Venus Express. Yeah, what you can see here um, are bright clouds made of sulfuric acid that cover the whole planet. It's a global cloud cover, and the cloud is 20 kilometers thick. Uh, this, that makes Venus a very, very bright uh, planet. Uh, and you cannot see the surface, at least in the visible or in the infrared or the, the UV wavelength. Um, the only one that were able to land on the surface were the, the Soviet, in, in the Soviet Union in the 1970s. Uh, a, Ven uh, a lander called Venera, uh, I think it's Venus in, in Russian, uh, landed on the surface and found very, very harsh conditions. So it's very hot and there are 90 bars of CO2. It's a very, it's a desolated land, but it's very dry. Uh, because of the, the hot temperature, the lander only survived a couple hours. But it was enough to send images back to Earth of what it looks like. Um, here are other measurements, uh, joint measurement by uh, the Magellan spacecraft of NASA that measure the topography. And on top of the topography, you can see the colored squares are the temperature. It's a temperature surface field measured by uh, Venus Express again. And what you can see here is the, um, the fact that there is a mountain that is hot, hotter than the rest. And that was this, the first discover, discovery of an active volcano on Venus, showing that Venus is a volcanically active world. Um, so how did Venus uh, came to be the planet it is? Um, we have uh, one likely scenario. It's a climate change scenario, really, where the greenhouse gas here is not CO2, but water vapor. Water vapor traps heat, and as it traps heat, the temperatures rise. And because the temperature rise, there is more water vapor that is, but there is more water that is vaporized and goes into the atmosphere. And so this is a, a dreadful, dreadful uh, feedback loop where Venus gets hotter and hotter to the point where we think what happened uh, one billion years ago is that the whole planet uh, had a temperature of more one, than 1,000 uh, Kelvin, or more, more than 1,000 uh, Celsius degrees. Uh, so the atmosphere got inflated, 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 and most of it was lost to space. The water uh, and most of the atmosphere and what was left was this very dry, uh, hot uh, planet. Now let's have a look at Mars. Mars is very different in terms of the atmosphere. Here, the atmosphere is very thin, only six millibars. Uh, what you can find on Mars, everywhere you go, is dust. That is to say, very fine uh, sand grains all over the planet. And what we see here are pictures uh, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. So let me try to move this. Oh. So I can see that here. So here are the dates um, of the pictures. Just a few weeks apart, um, we see how big of a change we have on the planet as the dust was lifted into atm in the atmosphere by winds, covering the whole planet and giving birth to a uh, global dust storm. So Mars is really uh, like a global desert planet with a lot of dust. And besides dust, what can we find? We can find a lot of water. So here is an image of the northern polar ice cap on Mars taken by Mars Express. It's one of the big uh, European Space Agency uh, spacecraft. Um, so here the North Pole is around here. And to give you an idea of the size of this, this is almost as big as Greenland. And all the white bright stuff is almost pure water ice. So we've known about the presence of water in the on Mars since the 1970s, approximately. 
And the main reservoir of water is the Northern Pole, uh, with uh, this polar cap, polar cap being at most a couple of kilometers thick. We also find a lot of ice uh, in craters. So this is a crater uh, near the in the northern plains near the, the polar cap that is filled with uh, once again almost pure uh, water ice. Uh, this is an image taken by the Viking lander. So the Viking lander was the, the first uh, successful mission to the surface of Mars by NASA in the 70s. And it was a fixed lander. So it took uh, pictures of the landscape every day until one day it took this picture where you can see all the, the white stuff is uh, water ice frost deposited on the surface during the night, showing how there is a diurnal and seasonal cycle of water on Mars. Here is another example of the Phoenix mission that was in the year um, approximately 2010, uh, sent by NASA. It's a fixed lander in the northern plains. And the goal was to uh, detect the presence of water, ice, underneath the surface. And it didn't take long to, um, to find it. As you can see here, uh, you can see the nozzle of, of the lander and the, 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 the retrojets blew away uh, sand and, and dust and revealed the, the bright ice, ice patch that you can see here. So we know there is a lot of, of, of ice underneath the surface. Because there is ice on the surface, there are also uh, clouds in the atmosphere. This is an image by Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter of NASA, uh, showing you all, all the, the, the bluish patches are uh, water ice clouds, uh, the same that one that you can find in Earth's atmosphere. Um, and here are images of the NASA rover uh, showing you the sky. And it really looks like Earth clouds, they are clouds made of water ice, high altitude clouds. So there is a lot of water on Mars. The thing is, the atmosphere is so thin that you cannot form liquid water, only solid and uh, gas form, not liquid. However, when we look at the landscape from the orbit, we can find very fascinating landscapes. So it doesn't take a very advanced uh, degree in, in geology to, to see that here, you have something that looks like a river, river bed for channels. And we know that they were uh, eroded by water uh, a long time ago. Now it's very dry, but we have found that they were formed uh, at the beginning of the history of Mars, almost 4 billion years ago. A liquid water flowing on the surface when Mars had uh, a thicker atmosphere that let it have uh, a water cycle, liquid water like we have on, on Earth. Here is another image from Mariner. It's uh, as a spacecraft from one of the earliest spacecraft sent to Mars in, at the end of the 1960s. You can see again all the river bed forms, all the water what that, that was flowing. Another example is a more recent measurement by the NASA rover uh, MSL that uh, showed uh, layers of sediments showing that there was water at this place flowing, deposited during a long period of time. The big question that we don't, we don't know the answer of is for how long did we have liquid water? Was it just uh, very local for a short amount of time? Did it happen globally for millions and millions of years? So there is a lot of debate scientifically today. We don't really know the answer. We know that there was liquid water, but we don't really know the details of it. So what happened to Mars? Why did it lose its atmosphere? And, 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 and why did it lose all its liquid water? Some of it was, is now stored in the northern polar cap, but some of it is missing. To answer this question, uh, NASA sent a spacecraft called MAVEN. Um, and the goal was to um, study the upper atmosphere and the atmospheric escape. So what can, you can see here is Mars. Uh, here in the middle, and there is a filter uh, to detect the presence of hydrogen, hydrogen atoms. And this is what you can see here. The, the bright stuff here is just hydrogen atom escaping from the planet. And from this mission, um, scientists were able to 
uh, reconstruct the scenario of how Mars lost its atmosphere, its water, is the solar wind, that is to say charged particles from the sun that eroded the atmosphere and took away the, the, the lighter elements like hydrogen uh, that form uh, water. And due to its lower mass and lower radius than Earth and Venus, uh, Mars uh, easily lost most of its atmosphere and water. So that was the, the sad story of Mars. Uh, now let's have a, a look at, at Earth. So this is uh, one of the picture taken by the, the, the one of the Apollo mission uh, of the global picture of, of, of Earth. But what if you go back in time? Uh, what, what can you what can you expect? That's probably what you would find uh, a few hundred million years ago, uh, a planet that is completely frozen. It is called the snowball Earth, where the all of, all of Earth is covered by ice. So when it's covered by ice, uh, it's very bright. It has a high albedo. Because it is very bright, it reflects more sunlight. So the temperature is cooler. And because the temperature is cooler, it is stable for well, ice, for global glaciation. Uh, and that is a stable state called the snowball Earth. So we think that Earth went through multiple uh, stages of global glaciation, snowball Earth. Uh, during its past. And if we look at that in a global context of the atmospheric composition, uh, you, you'll find this very uh, interesting fact is that here is plotted the uh, amount of oxygen in Earth's atmosphere. So today, oxygen makes 20% of uh, Earth's atmosphere. But in the past, so you can see in this timeline, at the beginning, when life appeared at the very beginning of, of Earth, uh, there was almost no oxygen. And what created oxygen, what brought oxygen into the Earth atmosphere was life itself. And we, we have reconstru reconstructed the history of oxygen. So there was a first peak, then a decrease, then a second peak. And the, the present day level of oxygen was only uh, reached in the last 500 million years. And during those, those different Periods, there were multiple full glaciation periods here. So if you if you take a time machine and you go back in time, you have to be careful because you might not find Earth as a habitable planet as it is today. In other words, the diversity of the solar system is not only about planets, it's also it also happens in time with um, the evolution of terrestrial planet, uh, that is a strong component of it. Um, as a conclusion, this is a, uh, an example of the, the, a very interesting kind of planet. Uh, this is a planet that is, uh, this is the artistic fiction of a planet around a red dwarf. So a red dwarf is a star that is much smaller than the sun. Uh, because it is much smaller, the nuclear uh, fuel of the star lasts longer and they are very, very long lifetime, hundreds of billions of years sometimes. Because of this, they are the most abundant stars in the universe. Almost 75% of stars are red dwarf. So because they are the most abundant type of stars in the universe, we also uh, think that the most abundant type of planets in the universe are planets orbiting red dwarfs, like this one. And because they orbit a small star, they are tidally locked. But you see the tidal forces make the planet always showing the same face to the star with uh, a permanent day side and a permanent night side. If you were to stand on the planet, you would see the, the, the star, the sun, always in the same location. And if you're on the night side, it's forever, it's forever the night. So what are the conditions on those planets, the most abundant exoplanets in the universe? We don't really know because we don't have uh, observations. Well, we know they exist, but we don't have any observations of their climate, their atmospheric composition, their surface, and so on. We have to rely on model. And we don't have any example of this in the solar system. So one of the big questions uh, right now in uh, exoplanet science is, what is the diversity of those worlds? Is it the same as in the solar system? Uh, what can we expect to be evolved? Uh, that's a big question that the next generation of uh, space telescopes uh, will answer.
Well, thank you very much. I think Jared will, will explain how it works. So. Can you all hear me? Is this all good? Oh, wait. Oh, there we go. Um, all right. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Jared Splinter, and uh, I'm a graduate student here at the McGill Space Institute. And uh, following off of the great talks from Tamar and Eve, I'm going to be talking about how we actually observe some of these exoplanets, how we've done it in the past, and what we can kind of expect in the future. And of course, the thing that most people want to know right away is, can we find habitable worlds? Uh, when can we find them? And of course, we're trying to look for them, but I'm here to try to tell you that on our quest to try to find some of these habitable worlds, we found some other very cool worlds, such as 55 Cancri E. This is an artist concept of the planet, but it is a lava world. Uh, where it's so hot, it's melting all the rock and creating these magma oceans. Uh, and I really like this one because it kind of reminds me of Mustafar, if we have any Star Wars planets, uh, Star Wars fans in the audience. Um, maybe a planet you actually don't want to go and have a lightsaber duel on, though. Um, but we also have other cool planets like WASP-76b, where it's thought that it rains iron in the atmosphere or we have uh, HD 189733B, a beautiful blue world where it's thought that it rains glass in the atmosphere sideways, um, just to make it more interesting. Or we have Kepler 16B, uh, which orbits around two stars. Um, and this is actually a poster that comes from the NASA Exoplanet Travel Bureau, uh, which is kind of an imagining of like what it could look like if we were able to go to visit these worlds at some point. And so the tagline here is relax on Kepler 16b, uh, the land of two suns where your shadow always has company. And again, this planet kind of reminds me of Tatooine. So uh, sticking with the Star Wars theme, it's kind of fun to think about all the sci-fi, what they can kind of get right there. But of course, because I love these types of posters so much, I have to include one more. So this one is Trappist-1e. Tagline, Planet Hop from Trappist-1e voted best Hab Zone vacation within 12 parsecs of Earth. And so this system has a lot of planets within it, but you might be wondering what does Hab Zone mean? And well, that stands for Habitable Zone, which is a region of space around a star that we all um, are looking for, of course, if we want to find a habitable world, because it's an area of space around a star that's not too hot, it's not too cold, but it's where we think that liquid water could potentially exist on the surface of these worlds. And of course, if we're looking for a planet that we would want to visit maybe in the future, um, or could it have life, we want it to be kind of a Goldilocks type of planet where it's not too big, it's not too small, it's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's just right for the conditions that we're looking for. But as uh, Tama alluded, alluded to, um, the habitable zone is kind of dependent on what the size and the temperature of these stars are. So you can imagine a larger, hotter star, the habitable zone will be pushed out a little bit further away than what we have here in our solar system. But for M dwarfs that are a lot smaller and cooler, um, the habitable zone is a lot closer towards the star. So these could potentially be the best places to look for habitable worlds. But of course, the first step of the whole process is to try to find these planets in the first place. So here are just five ways of which we can use to detect these planets to find them in the first place. I'm not going to dive through all of them. I will go through two methods just to give you a little taste of what we can do. But with that in mind, uh, again, we are kind of in bias towards certain types of planets, uh, bigger planets, just because they're a little bit easier to see. Um, and then, of course, we see a lot of planets that are very close to their star. And with that comes tidal locking, where you get this uh, effect where basically the rotation period of a planet matches that of its orbital period. So you get a situation where the planet always has one side facing towards a star, which basically means that it has a permanent day and a permanent night side. Uh, we have an effect like this here in our system, actually, with the moon. And I have to include this figure because I love the concept of a balding moon. Um, but we have one side that's always facing towards us. And you also probably have heard about the dark side of the moon, obviously made popular by Pink Floyd. Um, so using this in mind, as Eve also mentioned, we have detected a lot of exoplanets, over 5,000 to this point. But statistically speaking, we also think that there are way more in the universe, at least one planet per star is what we think. 
um, possibly more. Um, so there's a lot of exoplanet finding missions trying to go and hunt for these worlds out there. And here are some of the ones that we've used in the past. This is a figure of a timeline of the space telescopes that we've used uh, for that. Um, the ones on the top are the ones that were dedicated just solely to exoplanets. And the ones on the bottom were the ones that are sensitive to exoplanets, but not using their full time for that. Of course, we also have ground-based observatories, but space telescopes tend to be a better method of actually looking for these things. So I wanna draw your attention to three of these guys, the planet hunters, uh, Korot, Kepler, as Eve mentioned in her talk, and Tess, which their whole mission is to just go out and try to find as many planets as they possibly can. And then we also have the planet inspectors, Hubble and Spitzer. Uh, they were they helped us to help uh, figure out what sort of atmospheres are out in there with these exoplanets. Um, but again, uh, Hubble and Spitzer were never designed to do this in the first place. So now with future telescopes like James Webb, and CHOPS, which just recently launched James Webb here on uh, Christmas Day, 2021, uh, we're gonna be able to do a little bit more with that as it actually has that in mind. I'll dive into that a little bit at the end of the talk, but now you might be wondering, well, how do we actually find what the atmosphere of a planet is like? Um, Cause we can't just travel to these planets and you know measure it ourselves. How do we do it from here on earth? And obviously we, want to find an atmosphere is pretty uh, important for us. The greenhouse effect keeps us nice and warm here on Earth, um, maybe too warm these days. But, uh, you know, we want to figure out, can we go, can we breathe oxygen, obviously, on these planets? Possible. So the way we do that is we actually have to isolate the light that's coming from these planets, just to get it away from all the starlight, background contamination, and just figure out what the light is coming from this planet, because the light actually carries information with it. And so one of the ways we can do that is through this method called direct imaging. Um, and we use what's called the coronagraph to block out the starlight, and we can directly image these planets as they go around. Now, the, 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 this method is a little bit biased in different ways. Uh, again, big planets, easier to see, but we also like them to be young systems as the planets are still very hot after formation, but also a little bit further away from the starlight so that starlight does not contaminate uh, the situation. As you can see, we're talking on scales here of 20 AU, which is 20 times the Earth to Sun distance. Uh, but another method, which is maybe more abundant and abundantly used, is uh, the transit system. Oop. Oops. Well, I'll just go with this. Anyway, the transiting system, which involves a star moving in front of its, uh, or a planet moving in front of its star and potentially behind it. And what happens there is that as it moves across uh, from our line of sight, we see the planet move in front of the star and it blocks out some starlight. And we can actually use that to help isolate the light from that. And also as it goes behind, that's called an eclipse, which we can use to just see the starlight from that by itself. Observing this whole um, uh, orbit around here is called phase curve, which is something I actually do with my research. And if you can remember back to the discussion on tidal locking, if we have um, a side that's always facing the star with these planets, then we're actually kind of getting a 360 view of the entire planet, getting a way to see the atmosphere at all angles from the situation. Uh, so from that, this is how we kind of isolate the light. We have the light from coming from both the star and the planet. Then we have just the star, which we can see by itself, and we can isolate the light spectrum of the planet. Now you might be wondering, well, what is a light spectrum? And a spectrum looks something like this. Now this isn't a rainbow, even though it looks like one. This is actually light that's coming from our sun. And it was put through an instrument called a spectrograph. Uh, but obviously it's not perfect rainbow. Uh, you see a bunch of black lines through there. And what that actually correlates to is molecules. We're detecting molecules absorbing at certain wavelengths of light. And it tells astronomers, hey, there's molecules here at, in this light. That's why the light's carrying this information. Um, we use the same uh, method for exoplanets. We can use look at the light that's coming from the atmosphere and then detect the molecules that are there. We just recently did this with uh, James Webb, one of the first images released was uh, from the planet WASP-96b. They used this to look at the, the light curve and they found uh, detections of water vapor in the atmosphere. 
And that leads me into talking about James Webb because it's one of the things in the space community that a lot everybody's excited about. It is the most powerful telescope ever built, uh, the successor to Hubble, uh, and actually is now built with exoplanet atmosphere characterization in mind. Uh, but of course, because it's such a popular telescope, it's not going to be spending all of its time on exoplanets. It's going to look at galaxies and everything else in the universe. So for looking more at exoplanets, we have the Aerial Space Telescope, which is being built by the European Space Agency, uh, which is set to go up sometime in 2029, hopefully. Uh, and this telescope will actually exclusively look at planet atmospheres uh, and help us throughout its mission life cycle to observe uh, atmospheres of planets, uh, over a thousand planets, hopefully. Um, but even looking farther in the future, we have the HAVAX slash Louvoir telescope, hopefully uh, launching sometime in the mid 2030s. Um, this one will actually be able to directly image Earth twins, um, looking at solar type stars, um, similar to our sun. At the same distance, Earth the sun, or the yeah, Earth the sun distance, it will be able to see if there are any planets there, see if we can isolate the light from that, see if we can get any habitability from that detect signs of biosignatures or anything. And uh, so with these future tech telescopes, these next generation telescopes, we're gonna be able to find these planets uh, to remarkable precision, their temperature on the planet, the molecules that are present in the atmosphere. And also through the help of some models, we can uh, kind of determine what we're actually seeing with the observations and see if we can uh, find uh, patterns of clouds and wind on these planets. So I just kind of want to leave you with this thought, with this future um, telescopes. Will we find a habitable world? What will it look like? Is it going to be around an M dwarf as we see a lot of these planets are really close in? Um, I don't know, but I think that I also want you guys to take away from tonight that the future of our exoplanet research is very bright. All right, thank you so much to our speakers. That was awesome. Uh, now, we get to have more fun. We get the Q&A period. So if anyone has uh, written down any questions on the little piece of paper, we have our volunteers who will collect that, but you are also welcome to ask questions, You know, raise your hand. So I'll invite our three speakers to join us up here. And we'll have to share the mic. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it is too. Two questions. Um, does, the, does the size of the star affect the size of the planets around it? Uh, um, so I can answer this question in two ways. So um, both the Toma and Jerry sort of mentioned this. So um, the star, like how we characterize the star. So size comes in um, and the mass comes in, but like what's, uh, I think what's uh, more important is how hot the star is. So um, if the star is, if the star is uh, small, this also tends to be polar, and uh, they also tend to live longer. So uh, that affects the habitability or the habitable zone that we've heard from uh, Jared. Um, and it also um, affects, it might also affect the birth environment. So, um, but it is a bit uncertain, but like we do think it changes the lifetime of the disk around and that it can also change the, what is the total mass budget and how much gas and how much dust you have like, around those stars. So the general idea is that around smaller stars, everything just tends to be smaller. So like you might, you will probably have like less material to begin with, but the complication comes in in the fact that 
how are those materials distributed within the disk? Like if you can have more dust concentrated in the inner region, then you might actually have more planets around the smaller stars. And actually we do find statistically that smaller stars do have more planets than the, than the hotter stars and the more massive stars. All right. Um, and then there's a second question about where does the momentum go when two rocks collide and stick together, latter forming a planet? So in other words, how do rocks stick together and not just collide and go away? All right, uh, so uh, that's a great question. Uh, so uh, it goes into, um, uh like uh, uh like, like 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 heat um uh so the so you can actually have like various different ways in which what happens after the collision you can have a catastrophic collision where things collide and they just shatter and you just like explode and just like spew out everywhere or you can also have a case where they will collide and literally um, escape out of the system. This definitely happens, especially when you're far away from the star because there's a less of a gravitational pull. But if you're really close in to the star, then there's too much of a gravitational pull that they will stick within the system. So there's a lot of time for that material to coalesce back again and again create this uh, bigger and bigger rock. So I hope that answers the questions. So the closer it is, it's less likely to escape the gravity. Well, that's another reason why there's a lot to see a lot of times close to the star, because it's easier for it to stay close. And if you have material outside, it tends to shoot away or uh yeah, um, that's a good point. So um yeah, definitely like when things um uh, when things collide, so the way to think about it is there is an energy being injected when things collide, right? To that reference this reference of material. Um, but so you have to uh, compare that, that injection of energy, energy to the, the graphic potential energy of the system. So it's obviously much greater when you're closer and closer to the star just because the gravitational pull is greater. And the farther and farther out you go, it's much easier to like escape things. Um, as to whether we really see more planets on the inside than outside, that's difficult to say because, um, as a very was sort of uh, alluding to, it's really hard to detect planets that are that far out. So actually, we have no idea whether there should be any like Earth-sized planets beyond, let's say, orbital periods of thirty days, that's ten times closer, uh, like ten times uh, faster than the orbital period of our present-day Earth. So that, that part is a bit hard to explain and it gets a bit more complicated. What is the implications of finding magnetically on the planet? Can we compare the geological system with the but can we find like the economics of the technology and the same as the other? Yeah, so in, um, what, what, generally speaking, uh, we see Venus as a planet having I mean, on one big uh, flex, one big technical flex. Um, there are examples, uh, multiple examples on Venus of uh, subduction zones, but very limited. Uh, subvention zone, and uh, it seems like it's a whole the, the whole planet is only one big unit. Um, uh, so that's very interesting because one of the key aspects of evolution for the evolution of, of Earth and the, the fact that Earth is habitable is that Earth has plate tectonics because it is a very um, it's um, it's a way for Earth. Recycle carbon to get rid of the carbon on a geological time scale in the atmosphere. And we see that Venus, the planet with almost the same size as Earth, that probably started in the same conditions as Earth, does not have the Um Well, that's 
would not as intense as for her. Uh, there are some locations where transmission done. There are some volcanoes, but it seems like it's not as strong as and as intense as on her. Um, one possibility, and science is not stable, is that the surface is uh, so hot that it doesn't have the same uh, plasticity as the, the plate tectonics on Earth bend and create all this motion. So this is something that Venus uh, teaches of plate tectonics and motion. Yes. Smith, so this uh, question is for Jared about you were showing the spectrum of light and the information that we're getting in that spectrum. Is that since we're dealing with space time and a lot of these planets are very far away, are we looking at the past and are we then, are we then predicting what's actually happening now? Do you understand what I mean? Like, if you're yeah. looking at the information, that information is from light and light is traveling here from far away. So, how do we know what's actually happening now? What we're looking at what's happening really in the past. Yeah, so I mean, like the light takes a certain amount of time to reach us. That's why they call it light years. It's the distance light travels in like a year. So I think the closest uh, star even to us is like three or four light years away. Um, so like you know, at least we're looking that far back in time. We're getting the light at that moment. But um, what we are seeing is a light carrying the information from that time. That you, you're absolutely right. Um, so are we predicting now? What can we say, all right, because of this information over the period of time, we say, well, it might be solid over the amount of time, or it might be turning to this, or light might have been re re created right now. Yeah, that's a good question, because I think that it also goes into like some of the models that like Ma was talking about, where we like, you know, have to kind of combine what we do. We just observe what we, the data that we get, and then we kind of use models to help predict uh, what we're kind of seeing. Um, I don't know if we can really necessarily predict what it would look like at this exact moment we're just saying oh this is what it is as we receive a lot at that moment i have a question so we often hear uh people talk about how we will detect biosignatures or evidence of life on other planets is there a well agreed upon uh, piece of evidence for a biosignature? Like, or, or are those heavily debated? I don't know who would answer. Um, well, it's, it's still debated. It's obviously because there are processes that will create oxygen or methane or CO2 that are not light based, but we basically go off of what we know on Earth. And so we look for those ones as good signs, but it might also be like a situation where, you know, you just had CO2 detected on a planet and people are already like skeptical of it, just that's that the job of scientists is to be skeptical. Um, so there's not necessarily agreed on set, it's just based on what we kind of go and go on with. Did we search for like a vast chemical, like for carbons or anything on these planets? Can we do that? Uh, so what we've done in the past is like, as I mentioned, with uh, Hubble and Cap, uh, you know, Cap um, Hubble and uh, Spitzer, uh, they were on design for atmospheric characterization. So one of the better ways to like look is in the wavelength, all the infrared wavelength. Uh, you see a little bit more light, you see a little bit more molecules. Um, for those more complicated ones that you're mentioning, I don't think you're necessarily uh, you can necessarily see those because uh, for a lot of these, they're very hot places, and so they don't dissociate very quickly. I'm fascinated by the lack of spin on the planets, on the majority of the planets. Is there any particular reason why? Because obviously, the one we're comparing our solar system, most of the planets spin. Why is it that they, they stay stationary around the sun? Um, so I believe it has something to do with the torque that the gravity of the stars can find on the on the planet. So over time, it kind of will do that for most bodies, but for close in ones that are working a lot quicker and have a lot greater gravitational torque on them, that it kind of aligns them to be hyperlock like that. 
And just to clarify, uh, they, they are still spinning. It's just that the rate of spin is synchronized. The rate of spin and the orbit, the rate of orbit is synchronized. Yeah. And the synchronicity comes from this entire interaction. So the, the gravitational torque that, that causes the synchronization. Um, is there any way that countries were able to now or maybe in the future detect like layers of atmosphere from exoplanets? Yeah, so that's actually something that's um, possible with James Webb and actually Hubble. It's called uh, spectroscopy. It's that you're looking at different uh, wavelengths, and those wavelengths actually pierce different altitudes of the atmosphere. So we're actually you're also able to build sort of like a two D profile. I guess the planet we can kind of understand what the pressure is uh, in the atmosphere and also the temperature at each point. Um, but that's not really something that's possible. It's something that's called photometry, where you're just looking at a particular wavelength, but in very high resolution. Um. So we looked at the development of these sort of super Earths and uh, making mini Jupiters, whatever. And uh, how our solar system has this strange arrangement of little rock planets and gas giants. Are there any other solar systems that have been discovered that have this sort of abnormal arrangement? Um, or be really not abnormal. Yeah, so that's a really good question because uh, to be to be very honest, we do not have the technological capability to detect true solar system analog. So it's a bit premature to say our solar system is definitely truly weird. So it is only weird in that we do not have the super Earth Neptunes and that the orbit inside the Mercury is completely empty. That's the only way in which it's sort of weird. Okay. More to be revealed. Exactly. Uh, so you mentioned hot pairs at the beginning. I was wondering, uh, since they're so close to the star and so up, it's such a hard atmosphere, uh, are they losing a lot of mass? Uh, great question. Um, I'm not sure if folks could hear the question. Um, sure. Okay, so I'll repeat it. Um, so the question was about the hot Jupiter. And these are, again, this gas giant really, really close in to the star. And the question was, because they're so close, are these giants of losing mass um, because of all this uh, energy that's coming from the star? And the answer is, it is, but it's so tiny that it doesn't really matter. Um, and the point here is that the ability for the planet to lose mass has two ingredients. The first is how much energy it's getting from the from the star, and also how how big is it? Like how much of a gravitational potential does it have? And it turns out these giants are so massive that it's it, it can very well hold on to this mass. So you're losing like tiny, tiny little amount over like a uh, giga year time scale. So these are fine. Um, so the question is on how we discovered Anglo moves and uh, the answer is no. I think there's been a couple of candidates, but they're again as scientists very heavily uh, scrutinized. Um, I just met somebody recently who we closed off at JPL that it, this whole mission is to try to find exomoons. So there's the hunt for them is also on. Any last question? Any burning questions? Yes, <laughs> yes. Yes. Sorry. I'd like to ask about what's been going on with Jupiter and 
how it's been observable. And I heard that apparently the next time we'll be observed with a survey, we can say it's 2029. That's true. Yeah, it's Sorry, we Well, is probably one of the brightest objects in the sky. Um, so, you can roll, please. Well, you have to imagine that the motion of Earth and Jupiter. Right now, um, Jupiter is truly by the sun, or the motion of your Earth. So, uh, Earth, the, the, the sun, Earth, and Jupiter are aligned and going very well. And the next time it will happen is when Earth will take a full orbit and it will be one year, Jupiter will move a little bit along its orbit. That's all. That's too much. So in a one year and two weeks month, it will be observable again in the same condition. So it's roughly every year that you can see it in the same condition. So for those of you who are talking about JWST, uh, and thanks for your talks, since you devoted your careers to space science and whatnot, what will be your biggest and greatest hope to discover in your individual careers, especially with James W. being out there? <laughs> well, I guess I can start because I'm starting it out. Um, I'm very excited to be working with James Webb. I'm uh, expecting some data from it next year, which is forever in science terms, but um, very excited for what it can do. Everybody in the space community, I think, echoes that. We're all very excited with it. So I'm just happy to be in the field right now at this point, just getting into it, um, especially because James Webb has been delayed for a long time. I think the first mentions of it going up for some time in 2010 or whatever. Um, so it's been delayed for a long, long time. Well, I, I personally don't work with James Webb telescope. I mostly work on solar system uh, missions, but I would love to see um, planets detected by James Webb that will be more than just, you know, just one signal, one point, and we don't know anything about the climate in the atmosphere. So when we will get data, about the atmosphere and the planet, about terrestrial exoplanets, then we'll make comparison uh, with planets in our solar system. That's called comparative planetology. And so I think there's, um, yeah, a new, new planets, uh, a new sample of planets in the universe, and uh, how we compare to what we already have. Um, yeah, so as someone uh, who was working on exoplanets, I always get really jealous when I look at my planetary science colleagues who have this amazing images and so much detail about what exactly is going on on the surface and the clouds. And I look at that and say, wow, I wish we had that in exoplanet community. And of course, it's so difficult, so far out, it's like impossible. Um, but we're getting very well, close uh, with the web and uh, uh, like being able to figure out what exactly that upper envelope is made out of would be would be really tremendous and that would also really help with the things that I do which is about the theoretical um, studies of planet formation uh, because then we need to figure out what exactly these planets are made out of so that we can locate where these planets might have formed within this Earth environment which also comes with different chemical signatures, which also could be probed by the web. It's not just the planets, it can also do disk physics as well. So that's what the, the telescope excites me about. Any other questions? I was wondering, do you have any questions for each other? <laughs> 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 they're all I think we talk have about. such a breadth of knowledge and it's a very integrated community here at the MSI which is great are there any other questions from the audience if not I just have a few announcements before we can have uh, mingling and come see us at the table outside for some stuff um so first of all, I just want to say thank you all for coming. This was great. And thank you so much to our speakers for taking the time to prepare all of those awesome talks.
I just want to remind everyone to please scan this QR code and answer a few questions for us uh, so that we can uh, better know how to plan these talks and what you would all like to see. We have these talks every the last Wednesday of every month. So in October, we are going to have an awesome dark matter talk uh, from people theorizing about dark matter, trying to look for dark matter out in the cosmos and also look for dark matter here on Earth. So that's really one to get excited for. That's the last Wednesday of October. So put that in the calendar. Um, with that, Carolina, do you have any announcements? Okay, 